Uh, the reason I chose this topic is because if I have an area of specialty within geography, it's, it's atmospheric sci sciences, namely weather and climate, mostly climate related, uh, but especially El Nino. I did my master's thesis on how uh, the different phases of El Nino and La Nina actually affect severe weather down south in the United States, especially in Florida. I did a uh, statistical analysis of a tornado type, type events, and there are certainly relationships uh, between uh, increased numbers and decreased numbers of tornadoes during the winter time, depending on which phase of El Nino or La Nina that we're in. <clears throat> but again, welcome. This should be about, uh, about a half hour presentation or so. Uh, but as you know, we instructors tend to go off on tangents and talk at great length from time to time on, on various items. So I'll probably go over a little bit over that, but you certainly won't be here for an hour, that's for sure. <clears throat> but let's start out, first of all, talking about what actually El Nino is. I'll tell you what it isn't. It is not that periodic storm that hits the United States West Coast, especially California, that you see all over the news all the time with whipping rains coming in and large waves crashing into the cliffs, the cliff sides off the Pacific. That's not what El Nino is. Certainly in effect, uh, certainly related uh, uh, atmospheric effects of El Nino, but what El Nino actually really is uh, specifically El Nino itself, this is a periodic warming of the ocean water in the equatorial Pacific region. And by the equatorial Pacific, we're talking about five to 10 degrees north and south of the equator, five, to 10 nor uh, degree, five or 10 degrees north and south latitude. So within you know, a, a few hundred miles to a thousand miles or so of width, but stretching across the equatorial Pacific. And we're, mainly, we're primarily concerned with the activity that's going on in the central and the eastern equatorial Pacific as opposed to the western equatorial Pacific. Not that that doesn't matter, but we're primarily focused on the central and eastern region when we're referring to El Nino. Now again, specifically, we're talking about warmer than average sea surface temperatures. <clears throat> this is actually not a new phenomenon. It's not something that we, j we just discovered. It's not something that's an effect of global warming or climate change or anything like that. This was something that was actually discovered hundreds of years ago by Peruvian fishermen. They realized that every few years or so, these warmer sea surface or these, these warmer ocean temperatures would creep their way towards the western coast of South America here, and it would drive away the, uh, their, their, their fish bounty for the season, and they would, you know, the, 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 basically the fishing economy down in that region would suffer. Again, as early as the 1500s, this was identified. But why do they call it El Nino? Anybody know why they actually call it El Nino? Has anybody heard this story? You have? Okay. <laughs> when did you hear this? <laughs> Just a little while ago, right? <laughs> exactly. The fishermen basically realized that when these warmer ocean waters would start coming their way, it was usually right before Christmas time. Uh, and again, every few years, but it w they would always seem to arrive uh, early in the winter, right before Christmas. And El Nino in Spanish, uh, capitalized, if you were to be writing out, you capitalize El Nino, it refers to the Christ child. So they started calling El Nino, uh, they started calling it El Nino because it usually arrived right around that, that time of year. But again, every few years or so. So, okay, so we see that there's warmer than average sea surface temperatures in this region periodically every few years. But what are the normal conditions in this region? Normally what you have in the, in the eastern and the central uh, equatorial Pacific region, what you have are much cooler sea surface temperatures and much warmer sea surface temperatures all the way in the western part of the region. Because that's, that's your normal conditions as far as sea surface temperatures. As far as the atmosphere, how the atmosphere behaves, Generally, the winds are flowing east to west pretty swiftly along the equator. And it's, it's kind of believed that these stronger winds that prevail going east and west, called the, called the trade winds, that these easterlies would kind of pile up the warmer sea surface waters over here in the western region, theoretically speaking. We don't know if that actually happens just yet. They're, they're still trying to figure out what, well, I'll get into that later. <laughs> but what we see, again, is uh, certain f uh, d definite atmospheric flow of the winds east and west. We also have the ocean currents along the equator flowing from east to west as well. So we have cooler sea surface temperatures in the eastern and central region, much warmer in the west. Th those are our normal conditions. <clears throat> this results in pretty dry, uh, in a pretty dry sky over in this region. Anybody know what desert is right along the South American coast here? 
Anybody know that driest region on Earth? The Atacama Desert. Very good. Geography major right there. Not only is this region blocking out winds coming from uh, the eastern side of the, co or from the, from the eastern part of the continent, the Andes Mountains here are blocking that out basically. So any, any um, water vapor in the air, any humidity in the air has to rise to such high altitudes over those mountains that the cold air at those high altitudes squeezes out all the water vapor and dumps it as rain on the eastern sides of those mountains. So that blocks out humidity and water vapor from this side. On this side, you know, you're right on the ocean. You'd think, well, gosh, they've got to have a lot of evaporation and, and water vapor in the atmosphere because of the ocean right there. Not really. The colder sea surface temperature, temperatures in this region do not really allow for a whole lot of evaporation. So the, the skies are generally pretty dry because of that as well. So this little strip of land, that Atacama Desert, is sandwiched right in between that. So that's why it's the driest region on Earth. But... <clears throat> You know, we're, we're more concerned with the, the sea surface temperatures at this, part, at this point. But if anybody ever gets into a discussion with you about that region, now you can tell them. Cold ocean water, excuse me, and the Andes blocking out anything from the other side. So we see this normal pattern. This is what the normal conditions in this region. We started, we started noticing this almost about 100 years ago now. Sir Gilbert, Gilbert Walker, he was a British scientist, did a lot of atmospheric research, and he was in this area, and he started taking measurements throughout this region. And he identified the same type of pattern. He said, generally what we have here is much higher atmospheric pressure from the subtropical highs, both in the northern and southern hemisphere. And the way that these guys rotate, drive the surface winds westward. Not only does that happen, not only is everything flowing to the west, but in the upper atmosphere you have this return flow coming back. Now it's not as simple as this uh, schematic here shows. There's obviously a lot more going on in the atmosphere than, than this shows as far as the different circulatory systems and all that. But eventually, uh, generally speaking, anything that flows at the surface west uh, rises up uh, higher up into the atmosphere in the western region. And as it cools and spreads out, it eventually makes its way back to the east and descends. Now again, not as simple as that, but it's, it's a general idea that still stands today. <clears throat> so he identified this normal circulation, which he named after himself, of course, the Walker circulation. But he also identified that there are changes in the circulation that happen periodically every few years or so. Okay, that sounds familiar, right? <clears throat> so th what he noticed was that every few years or so, these trade winds, these surface trade winds that blow to the west slow down. They weaken. And because of that, this, this walker circulation, this, this whole east to west flow and then the return flow at the upper altitudes before it descends and starts the whole process over again, it starts to weaken and the whole geographic, or pardon me, the whole geography of the system starts to shift to the east. Not only does it weaken, but the, the geographic area that it covers uh, is reduced as well. And the center of all the action, basically where the, where the air makes it to the west, warms and rises because of the warmer sea surface temperatures. Basically, the, more <clears throat> the warmer the sea surface temperatures you have, the more evaporation you're going to have, the more energy is being given off at the surface, the more warm air you're going to have rising. He noticed that that action center that you normally have every few years shifts to the east. And because of that, this walker circulation kind of slows down and dies as well. <clears throat> this coincided with uh, different pressure, atmospheric pressure systems increases and decreases in these. And he, started, he named this the Southern Oscillation. That, if you think of the term oscillation, it's something that goes back and forth, right? What he noticed was that every few years, the, the high pressure in the eastern part of the region would get much lower. And then the lower pressure that's normally dominant in the western part became much higher. Now, they didn't flip-flop, but there were, certainly much, there, there were certainly drastic changes in these that caused this whole walker circulation to the, the intensity to slow down <clears throat> and for the, sh the, ge the eastern geographic shift that, that he had recorded. <clears throat> Now, 
Now he also started realizing that, hey, you know, the, the people down in this area, they talk about how the sea surface temperatures are always, you know, becoming much warmer every few years. Coincidentally, this, these changes in the Walker circulation, what he identified eventually as something called a southern oscillation, coincided with these warmer and cooler sea surface temperature episodes, or this El Nino that came about every few years, the warmer than average sea surface temperatures in this region. What you're looking at here with these two, uh, with these two um, maps, schematics, I guess you could call them, again, your normal conditions. If you go back a couple slides here and you look at the, the normal walker circulation and then the normal uh, conditions on top here, you see that that coincides with the map here on top. The warmer sea surface temperatures are confined to the western part and then the central and eastern areas are much cooler. But when this walker circulation collapses and starts to shift to the east, you see this spreading of the warmer sea surface temperatures starting to spread east. So eventually they come up with something called El Nino Southern Oscillation. If you're ever reading through the media and you see the, uh, the acronym ENSO, E-N-S-O, that's what it stands for. The term is still used nowadays, um, but more, more common, you're going to hear scientists refer to this whole thing as El Nino and La Nina. El, La Nina is part of this Southern Oscillation El Nino thing, <clears throat> and I'll get to that in a minute. But generally, when you hear this term, that's what they're refer, for, referring to is, the, is the, uh, the relationship between the changes in the atmosphere, the different pressure signals, the Southern Oscillation, and then when El Nino arrives in the eastern part of the region. So uh, the problem right now with scientists, and they're still trying to figure it out, and we have all these really cool models, all this technology. We have far more atmospheric and oceanic data than we've ever had. But we still don't really have enough to tell us which one of these guys is happening first and which one triggers the other one to happen. Do the sea surface temperatures in the eastern and central region, do they warm up first, causing changes in the wind patterns and the, and the atmospheric pressure patterns? and for the whole walker circulation to shift east? Or are there changes in the atmosphere first that allow the sea surface temperature patterns to change? They still don't know yet. They have been run, there are so many different studies out there on coupled ocean, ac ocean atmospheric models. And what a coupled ocean atmospheric model is, is taking all the measurements um, from, the, from the ocean. You're taking the sea surface temperatures, the current direction, the current speed. Um, you know, all the different variables of the ocean. And now you're tying that information in with atmospheric dynamic information as well. Uh, wind direction, wind speed, uh, temperatures, humidity, all that different stuff. So they're taking all this different information and coupling it together from the ocean and from the atmosphere. It's a very difficult process and, you, I mean, it's certainly well beyond my understanding, that's for sure. This is stuff like physicists do and people who are specialists in statistics and calculus and all that. Not me. <laughs> I'm a geographer. <laughs> but they're still trying to figure out which, which is the primary forcing agent. Which one of these guys changes first and causes the other one to switch? Does the ocean change first or does the atmosphere change first, affecting the other? Still don't know yet. <clears throat> You're probably thinking, well, why is this guy up here talking if they don't even know what's going on yet? Because it's still a very interesting system. We actually do know a lot about it and we, we can actually predict what's going to happen. We just don't know which one is causing it kind of weird, I know. Okay, let's get into what La Nina is now. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the media, uh, your friends, even sometimes um, weather people that, you know, your, your TV meteorologist, for instance, these guys aren't always the biggest expert on everything out there. They might be good with weather prediction in their own local area, but I've even heard them misspeak often about what La Nina is, what El Nino is, and, and how these things work together. But contrary to, to popular belief, La Nina is not the complete opposite of El Nino, and El Nino is not the complete opposite of La Nina. They're all part of the same system, but what La Nina really is is actually normal conditions, just on steroids. You're talking very amplified normal conditions. So what we see with normal conditions is cooler in the east and central, as far as sea surface temperatures, warmer in the west, but now this effect is even stronger. It's even colder than normal in the central and eastern part. 
and warmer than normal in the western part, again, as far as the sea surface temperatures alone. This, wasn't, this really wasn't something that was discussed or talked about until like the 70s or 80s. Um, a scientist named George Flander is the first one who actually published something called El Nino and La Nina in a research paper in the monthly weather review. I, I believe that's what it was. Certainly one of the big uh, geek climate journals or weather journals that's out there. But this is something that's relatively newer, uh, uh, I guess, in, uh, relatively speaking, with, with this type of research on this topic. <clears throat> so again, it's not the complete opposite of El Nino. It's actually just normal conditions, but amplified. And again, El Nino is not the opposite of normal conditions either. It's more of a weakening or a relaxing of normal conditions. And I'll get to talking about that a little more as we go on here. Now let's look deeper, and in the quotes I have that up there for a reason, let's look deeper into what El Nino and La Nina really is as far as their sea surface temperatures. Why are the sea surface temperatures warmer and cooler in different areas? Basically the sea surface temperatures, we're talking about the temperature of the water at the very surface where the boat would hit the water, where your feet would land in the water if you jumped in. That's where the temperatures are taken. That is what's most important when we're trying to determine how much evaporation is being given off from the ocean. Again, cooler sea surface waters will not evaporate as much as warmer sea surface temperatures will. <clears throat> but there's something that controls that, and it's something called the thermocline, and that's many feet underneath the, the sea surface itself. Basically, what the thermocline is, is a boundary layer between the upper, lighter, much warmer water on top versus the much denser and colder layer below. So if, you, if, if, if anybody's ever done any diving or been in the ocean, I, I know I haven't, but uh, excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold here. <clears throat> but if, if you know anything about the, the ocean itself, there is a distinct difference as you go down in the ocean. You know, you're, you're, you're in a much warmer layer until you hit this thermocline and boom, you're in extremely cold water and much denser underneath after that. And it's not just the temperatures, it has to do with like the salinity of the water, how much salt is in the water and, and those types of things as well. But the deeper that thermocline is, the more warmer water is going to be on top of that. The deeper that pool of warm water, the more evaporation is going to be given off by the, by the, sea, by, by the surface the more energy can be held in a deeper pool of warm water. Think about filling your kids, some of you who have children, filling your kids' pool when they're kids. You fill it this much with warm water, you know, it's going to give off a certain amount of evaporation, right? But the more you put in there, the, the, the deeper layer of warm water you have, the more energy is going to be held in that. Think about that on continental scales or, or world regional scales. Think about that added energy the, the, the deeper the layer of warm water you have. It's certainly different, different throughout the equatorial Pacific. The normal conditions, our thermocline depth is pretty shallow in the, in the eastern and central part. It gets deeper as you go west, but the shallower area of the thermocline is where you have less warm water above that. So there's going to be not as warm sea surface temperatures and not as much evaporation being given off into the atmosphere. Whereas in the western part of the region, it's much deeper, far more energy, far more evaporation, <clears throat> far more activity is going to result in the atmosphere above that. And I'll get to how that happens soon. During El Nino, the thermocline doesn't flip. So it's, again, El Nino is not an opposite effect. It's more of a relaxation of your normal conditions. This thermocline depth in the, in the far west gets a little shallower, but it certainly gets much deeper in the central and eastern region. It's not really a seesaw effect because a seesaw effect would go back and forth like this, right? This is more like a, a lazy or a half seesaw effect where you have sort of a straightening out of the thermocline, but it never does quite straighten out. It's always going to be deeper in the western half of the region. But again, you know, the differences in the depth will determine how much energy is given off from that. So even though it's always deeper in the west, you can still have cooler than average sea surface temperatures in that region, although still warm. Okay, so what we have during El Nino, again, is this kind of a flattening out, or at least not such a sharp incline from the east to the west. This cools, again, slightly the sea surface temperatures in the west, but it drastically increases the sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern part of the region. 
During La Nina now, as we know, is again amplified normal conditions. Normal conditions on steroids, if you would. Put that in your notes. That's a good one to, uh, it's a good way to, at least it's a good way to think about it. <clears throat> but we have a much deeper than normal thermocline now in the east, or pardon me, in the western half of the region, and much shallower than normal in the central and eastern part. This allows for uh, cold, cooler sea surface temperatures in the central and the east, less evaporation in the atmosphere, less humidity in the air, far less atmos atmospheric activity as far as clouds and rain and, the, and that <coughs> kind of atmospheric activity. So these changes in the thermocline depth coincide almost directly with the changes in the sea surface temperatures. There's always a little bit of a lag when, you, when, you, when it comes to oceanography or when it comes to you know, studying the ocean and its energy. There's always a little bit of effect or a little bit of a lag effect when, let's say, the thermocline depth changes. You're not going to see those sea surface temperatures change immediately, but you will certainly see that within a few days to a week or so. Same thing with the atmospheric effects. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the changes in weather patterns and the changes in the atmosphere directly above will, 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 will react to the amount of energy being give, given off by the ocean. And I'm not talking about like the immediate region itself, but more distant regions as this energy that's given off by the ocean in the form of uh, evaporation, in the form of water vapor in the air, how quickly that can travel to distant global regions. <coughs> Okay, so again, just a, just a more of a specific look here at, at how this all works together. We we've, we've just talked about the thermocline depth and how that affects the sea surface temperatures. Now I'm going to get into how, a little bit more how this actually affects the atmosphere. I've talked a little bit about it already. I'm going to go into a little more detail. Again, the more, the, pardon me, the deeper of a pool of warm water you, you have, the warmer the sea surface temperatures are. The warmer that is, the more evaporation gets given off. Basically what drives our atmosphere is heat. That's one thing that's uh, your, 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 your typical person who watches the weather every day and knows a lot about it doesn't appreciate how much the atmosphere is actually driven by heat, whether it be from heat coming off of a dry surface from the sunlight warming it up. And that's one, another misconception. The sunlight does not warm our atmosphere. It warms the surface. The surface warms up and that energy given off by the surface is trapped in by the, the many different gases that make up our atmosphere. But there's a very small amount of gases in our atmosphere called greenhouse gases, which everybody hears a lot about with global warming and climate change and all that. But it's a very small percentage. And this small percentage of our atmosphere traps in all the energy given off by the surface. So the, the, the warmer the surface gets, the, uh, the more energy is going to be given off uh, into the atmosphere and going to be trapped in um, by our atmosphere. <coughs> The ocean works the same way, but it works a lot slower when it comes to warming up and cooling down. Any wet amount or anything wet will warm up and cool down slower than, than anything dry. And why is that? Well, basic physics will tell you that. I, I don't know what it is about water that does that, but now let's look at the fact that light penetrates water and it goes several feet down into it. So you're not just warming up the immediate surface like you are with land. You're warming up like an inch or so or less of the Earth's surface when, when that warms up. In the ocean, the light penetrates because water is translucent. It goes all the way, you know, many feet down and it has that much more to warm up on top of it. So that effect is very slow. Nevertheless, the amount of energy given off by the ocean is going to be a lot more than the surface because there's a lot more water vapor uh, given off in the form of evaporation. Evaporation not only is water vapor in the atmosphere, but it also contains a, a hell of a lot of energy and heat as well. And we'll talk about some of the effects this winter and you have every winter with, with El Ninos and how that uh, can moderate temperatures in the U.S. especially, but I'll get to that. <coughs> Not only is the, does, it, does it drive the air temperatures as far as the amount of water vapor in the air, but it also determines how many more clouds and rainstorms you're going to get. Obviously, the more humidity you have in the air, the more potential you have to form clouds and rain, right? Okay. So our normal conditions do look like this. You have this, this cooler sea surface temperatures in the eastern and central, not giving off much energy. Generally, a lot of clear skies in this region. Not so much in the west. Pretty much have these constant daily thunderstorms because of it, because of all the warm water in that region, giving off evaporation.
Now, during El Nino, as we see, the circulation kind of weakens and shifts over to the east, but the storm clouds follow. Now, we have much warmer than average sea surface temperatures in this region, so you're going to have a lot more storms <coughs> developing in the central, not as much in the eastern part as much, although you do. When I was talking about the Atacama Desert earlier, look up online tonight when you get home and you're playing on your computer, look up Atacama Bloom, and they'll show you the whole uh, large areas of this desert that completely bloomed every square inch of the, of the desert surface because of a large rainstorm that they had go through there. I mean, some of these areas of the desert don't get rain for 10 years, so you can appreciate how dry this is. Well, because, of, because it's that dry, any seedlings in the soil and all that sit there stagnant. But if, but if water touches them, they'll, they'll activate and they'll grow. And some of the rains that were brought to this region by El Nino this year made some really beautiful landscapes in this region. You should, again, look that up if, uh, if you ever get the chance. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> but generally speaking, we have a lot more, uh, again, a lot more cloudier conditions and rain in the central and the eastern part, but more, more specifically the central part of the region. And again, La Nina. Now we have, again, stre stronger than normal, <coughs> stronger than average normal conditions. Uh, just basically increases the intensity of everything that happens otherwise normally. So uh, don't really have much of a displacement of anything, but, but you certainly have drier than average conditions in the, in the eastern and central. And more energy, uh, I wouldn't say more rainfall as much, but uh, certainly a lot more energy in the, in the western region for sure. We're not concerned with that. We're more concerned with how, these are, how this is going to affect us here in the U.S. Before I go into the details, though, I want to show you a few maps here of what we can expect on your average El Nino winter and your average La Nina winter. And I'll tell you, and I'll explain why we're looking at winter specifically as opposed to summer um, in the slides to come. But what we see in the U.S., uh, as far as temperature anomalies, anomalies are departures from your average. Uh, during El Nino, on the left here for temperatures. In the upper part of the country, we generally see warmer than average temperatures. Don't let it fool you, this red. It's not hot up here in the wintertime. We know that. What that's just showing you is departures from average, using different shades of color to make things really stand out. Like, yeah, this area has quite a few, it's a few degrees warmer than average up in this region, You're, uh, generally in your El Nino winter. And down south, it's generally cooler. <sighs> How is it that? I'll get to that. But now let's look at the uh, precipitation or the rainfall or snowfall anomalies associated with El Nino as well. Generally up by us in, in, in the upper Midwest, we see a little bit more than normal snowfall. Some years, I mean, I can remember being in college when, uh, during the 97 El Nino. And it was a pretty strong one and we had a lot more snow than average that winter. But the temperatures were generally around average to a little bit above average. So, but, but we can maybe expect a little more snowfall. It wasn't predicted for this winter. I'll get to that as well. But what you really see as far as precipitation in the United States is increased rainfall in the south, along with the cooler temperatures in the south. And you also get a lot more rainfall along the California, especially the California western coastline. <clears throat> what about La Nina? Now, although El Nino and La Nina climatically are not opposites, you certainly see the opposite effects, though, on the United States, especially in the southern United States. You really see it. You can expect warmer than average temperatures. I don't know what happened with Florida here, but Florida should look like that in this one. I got this, for whatever reason, I couldn't find any data that was better than like 2000. Everything was like from 90s and lower. And we're talking like from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's website. For whatever reason, they just don't have a lot of published more recent maps. I know they have them out there. I know the research has been done, but I couldn't really find anything. This should show at least yellows, if not up to reds, though. Florida especially is much warmer than normal during the winter time, during the winter months. And so is a good part of the nation's midsection. But basically the warmer temperatures creep up to the north during La Nina winters. At the same time down south, you see much drier conditions as well. Okay? Again, I'll explain what this is, but if you know anything about the U.S. south, especially Florida, you know that Florida has basically gets all their rain in the summertime and during the wintertime, it's not saying they don't get any rain at all, but far fewer days of rain 
during the winter time down there. <clears throat> but during La Nina, it's even drier than normal. Well, what explains these different types of patterns? And what explains winter weather in the U.S. in general? Well, it, in general and, and associated with El Nino and La Nina, it depends primarily on three things. How much water vapor, how much humidity is in the air? Generally, our winters in the U.S. are very dry. You know, around here, generally, our, generally you walk around all winter touching anything, and you're just like, well, I don't, don't want to touch that because I'm going to get shocked, right? Like this winter, I've hardly walked around at all and touched something and, you know, got buzzed. There's been a lot of extra humidity in the air. But our winters, especially in, the, especially in the upper half of the country, the northern half of the country, you know, the amount of water vapor in there, the, the amount of humidity is, is huge when it comes to determining what kind of winter you're going to have as far as temperatures and as far as snowfall. So the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere flowing over the United States, and I'm talking flowing over from west to east, from the, from the, north, from the north half of the Pacific flowing west or probably flowing to the east over the continental United States. <clears throat> the size and the strength of the subtropical high pressure system over the northern Pacific. Now, I don't mean over the north part of the northern Pacific, just the north Pacific closer to the equator. The subtropical high is actually much closer to the equator, but in the northern hemisphere. And depending on that, depending on the size and the strength of the North Pacific subtropical high will determine the average position, the seasonal mean position, the seasonal average position of the jet stream. And, if, and most of you are here because you pr probably know a little bit about the weather. The jet stream, for those of you who don't know a little bit about the weather, is basically this rapid flowing tube of air in the upper atmosphere. And that's the boundary between the warmer tropical air masses to the south and the much colder and drier air masses, polar air masses to the north. Uh, how, how that tube or that river of, of air in the upper atmosphere gets going is basically a sharp drop between the top of the atmosphere where it's in the warmer part of the world and a much, much thinner or a much, hmm, how would I describe this? I guess a more thin layer of atmosphere over the colder parts, northern parts of the earth. But there's a, a, there's a there's a real quick drop between the tropical air masses and where the polar air masses are and the atmospheric, the upper level atmospheric pressure that results from that basically creates a steady stream of rapidly flowing air in the upper atmosphere. And that, uh, as you know, is often that boundary area of where, where the warm and old, cold air masses meet. This is where you get a lot of your storm activity, where you have warm and dry, warm and colder air masses meeting and, you know, creating clouds, rain, storms, whatnot. <clears throat> so these three things are determining what kind of winter weather we're going to have in the U.S. And again, winter is more important because our atmosphere is normally, normally very dry. You can put a huge influx of water vapor into the air and all of a sudden things change. During the summer months, not as much. We're humid anyway in the summer. We, we have much more humidity in the air in the summer. An influx from the Pacific isn't going to change things that much because we get plenty from that big bathtub called the Gulf of Mexico down to the south of us. That basically is what drives the eastern two-thirds of the United States as far as uh, summer weather and as far as uh, the warmer temperatures. But nevertheless, sea surface temperature conditions all the way in the equatorial Pacific from the central or from the eastern, central, and western part of the Pacific. The sea surface temperatures in this area are what determine these variations in the amount of water vapor we're going to have in our winter time, the size and the strength of the subtropical high in the northern half of the Pacific, and because of that, where our average jet stream position is going to be throughout the year. <clears throat> All right, so a little more detail about uh, the evaporation, the, the effects of the evaporation here. <clears throat> Again, as I've explained, the warmer the sea surface temperature is, the more evaporation is going to be given off, right? <clears throat> This is more of a, this is more important when we're looking especially at the central equatorial Pacific. We have this subtropical high that sits right about here, this northern, again, this North Pacific subtropical high. The more evaporation that's being given off in that central region, the more of that water vapor in the atmosphere is going to make its way into our subtropical high. The northern flank of that subtropical high, and my hand's going this way, I use my laser pointer for this. Subtropical, or pardon me, high pressure systems rotate clockwise. Okay, so we have this guy circulating around right here. 
And as you can see, as he swings down to the south, he's going to be picking up a lot of that water vapor in the atmosphere given off near the equator in the central region. And as that flow swings northward, it's going to be carrying that into the middle latitudes where we are here in the United States. Well, this isn't the only, sub, this isn't the only subtropical high pressure system. There's many of these throughout the world. There's a whole series of subtropical highs on both sides of the equator, straddling the equator on both hemispheres, as well as a, a series of low pressure systems called the equatorial low pressure belt, or something called the intertropical convergence zone, for those of you who have physical geography with Dr. Sharkey right now. <laughs> but uh, so we're primarily concerned with what's going on here in the central, because if it's warmer than average here in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific, that's where our, our North Pacific subtropical high is going to pick up that additional water vapor and carry it over into the United States. <clears throat> so again, uh, during an El Nino, where sea surface temperatures are, are warmer, more evaporation, more water vapor, more humidity making its way into the U.S. During La Nina, cooler than average sea surface temperatures in this region, much less than normal. <clears throat> well, what about uh, the high pressure systems? How, how does that affect the high pressure systems and, and you know, the, the position of the jet stream and all that? The energy, as I was talking about earlier, the amount of the, the depth of the thermocline, the depth of that warm water pool, determines the amount of energy through evaporation, but just energy in general that drives, oops, that drives these subtropical highs. The warmer the sea surface temperatures in this central region here, the warmer those are, the faster and stronger this North Pacific subtropical high is going to rotate. Think about sticking your hand in a bucket of water and you're turning the water around, right? You're doing it slow. You see that kind of little dip in the water in the middle, that swirl in the, in the water. You see it kind of start to dip a little bit the faster you start turning it, right? Our, our pressure systems work the same way. The more intense they are, the more they're actually going to constrict and become tighter. The slower they're moving, or the less intense they are, the more they're going to expand. The jet stream, whoops, I keep doing that. The jet stream here, it's, this is kind of a, a bad example, but really what this should show right here is the jet stream touching this northern flank of the subtropical high in the Pacific. The jet stream rides right along the northern flanks of all the subtropical highs. The way that these guys rotate, and, and look how here in the north, the rotation is pushing from west to east in all of these subtropical highs. So basically, the northern flank pushes the jet stream from east to west, so to speak, at the surface, as far as the surface level winds. But it also does so in the upper atmosphere, again, with this big dip between the, the layers of the warm and the cold air, <coughs> uh, also driving this jet stream. But that position of the jet stream is, sorry, <laughs> that position of the jet stream is determined by where the northern flank of the subtropical high is. Again, if it's rotating tighter and faster, if it's stronger and it's rotating tighter and it becomes smaller, it's going to bring down where the jet stream is. It's going to bring it farther to the south because this whole thing shrinks. So as, as this thing shrinks and becomes tighter, that jet stream is going to come farther south with it. Just the opposite during La Nina. If this thing is weaker than normal, it's going to be much larger than normal and it's going to be moving slower. So the jet stream is not going to be moving as swiftly and it's going to be pushed up farther to the north. Okay. Now we're going to get probably the most complicated part of all this. This is another one of those theoretical di type diagrams. This isn't exactly really what happens. But these subtropical highs are driven by something theoretically called a Hadley cell. A scientist named Hadley obviously identified this. But let's say you're on the equator and you're in the far western part. Say you're standing right over here, okay, and you're looking straight east along the equator. Say you're looking at the, the west coast of South America there. This is what you'd see. This would be the, the northern hemisphere. This would be the southern hemisphere. Let's focus over here. The rising warm air at the equator, as the, as, as the, as the warm air rises, it gets into the upper part of the atmosphere where it cools. 
you know, the higher you go up in altitude, the more it cools, right? The more water vapor that's in the air, when it hits cooler conditions, starts to get squeezed out like a sponge. While the water, vo while the water vapor mo molecules start to slow down, they start to bump into each other and stick together, form larger droplets of water. Eventually, you can see these water vapor uh, particles uh, come together in, in large bunches called clouds. And if that collision, of the, if the collision of those uh, droplets of water and begin to coalesce or stick together and form larger droplets, eventually they'll, stay, they'll, they'll become too large, they start falling out as rain. Gravity pulls it down naturally. That's based, that's in a nutshell, that's how a, how, how a cloud and rain uh, formation happens. <clears throat> but as that happens, as this warm air rises into the upper atmosphere and, and all the water vapor starts getting squeezed out, uh, it gets dumped out as rain, but the air starts to then spread poleward so it's spread towards the North Pole. And as it, as it starts to spread towards the North Pole, it starts to descend because it's now cooled. Uh, the condensation process actually, uh, it's, as the water vapor is squeezed out of it, now they've got this dry air flowing, sorry, flowing poleward. And, and it, because it's cooler, now it starts to descend. Now, I'm not talking like much cooler. But nevertheless, the cooler, the cooler the air is, the more it starts to drop versus the warm air that rises, right? This northern end of the Hadley cell, God, I keep doing that, I'm sorry. <laughs> the northern end of this Hadley cell, um, where the cooler air starts to descend, is actually the subtropical high pressure belt. This is that North Pacific subtropical high pressure uh, cell that I was showing you in the, in the previous slides. So you're looking right here. This is where a subtropical high is. Now you have this return flow again towards the equator and then the whole process just kind of continues. It's something called a positive feedback loop where it's just a process that amplifies and kind of grows upon itself. But it's more or less of a never ending cycle uh, everywhere along the equator in both hemispheres. But it's what drives the subtropical highs. The descending of the cooler air in the northern part of the Hadley cell creates the subtropical highs. Okay. Now, this is, this is actually what's affected by the amount of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere and the amount of energy given, being given off by the ocean. Earlier, I told you how the, the subtropical highs will expand or contract depending on how much energy is being fed into them, how, how powerful they are. Well, this, is, uh, this happens, uh, it actually, the same thing happens to the Hadley cells. So the, the, the more energy you're gonna give off into the Hadley cell, the tighter this guy is going to start rotating and he's going to start, the, the northern extent of it is going to be pushed towards the equator, thus bringing down that jet stream location which rides along the northern flank of it. <clears throat> so we'll look at some, some specific examples. But nevertheless, what you see here at the Hadley cells is going to determine the strength of the subtropical highs and thus the position of our jet stream. Again, separating our colder air masses from the north and our warmer air masses to the south. So this is what really determines what kind of weather you're going to have at any given day. And looking at the average jet stream position throughout the winter or throughout a season deter will determine a, you know, what, type of, uh, what type of season that you had as far as temperatures and precipitation as well. As we know that the storm track generally follows that boundary between the warm and the cold air masses. So during El Nino, I, I took these... <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I couldn't find anything cool online that showed like a live diagram or any kind of like uh, animation or anything like that. I couldn't find anything really cool. So I just took these things and I took this image and I shrunk it this way to give it the effect of this Hadley cell is rotating tighter now, as you can see. <laughs> but, but in essence, that's, that is what happens. The warmer sea surface temperatures will make this thing spin faster. And as it spins faster, it contracts. Now, where you have the... Uh, cool air from the atmosphere descending and creating the high pressure cell is a lot closer to the equator than normal because it's being because of the the intensity of it has been amplified. Okay, so this will bring the jet stream that's the, the average jet stream pattern, which again rides along that northern flank of it. It brings it farther to the south, bringing with it cooler air from the north, and giving it the area where the warm and cold air masses meet allowing more rain or cloud formation and eventually rain and, and storms to develop as well. Now during La Nina we have the opposite. Now I took this image and stretched it to give it the effect that hey we have not as much energy rising in this 
in this central equatorial, equatorial region. We have a lot less, so this thing isn't spinning nearly as fast, and because of that, it's much, it takes up a larger geographic area than normal. Now we have the descending air from the, sorry, now we have the descending air that forms the subtropical high, sub subtropical high pressure system much farther to the north, much farther away from the equator, bringing that jet stream position, again, which rides along the northern part of it, keeps it farther to the north instead of, instead of tugging it farther down to the south. <clears throat> okay, so that's what we normally have during El Ninos and La Ninos. We normally have in, the, in, in our region here in the Midwest, we normally have a little bit warm, you know, some warmer temperatures, warmer than average temperatures by a few degrees on average, and usually a little bit more precipitation, usually in the form of snow. And down south, we have much cooler and wetter conditions during El Nino. Okay, so like what happened this winter because we're not really seeing that this winter. We certainly had, we probably are having warmer than average temperatures, but keep in mind we have three weeks of winter left, folks. <laughs> it's not March, it doesn't mean, or it is March, it doesn't mean it's spring yet though. Heard some people talking about that earlier. It is hard to believe it's March, but keep in mind uh, our winter weather lasts well into March, sometimes into April. If you're from Wisconsin, you shouldn't ever be surprised what the weather's like ever, 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 ever. <laughs> so what, what happened this winter? Why aren't we seeing that? We had, we're supposed to have like this mega El Nino this year. They, they mean, uh, they've been calling it like the Godzilla of all El Ninos. So here I'm thinking as an El Nino guy, I'm thinking we're going to have a lot more snowfall, a lot more. Instead of that, just a little bit more than average, we're going to have a lot more than average because of this. And we're probably going to be, I wouldn't say much warmer than average, but maybe even a little bit cooler because of the possibility of this jet stream being tugged so far down to the south so often, it's going to bring such uh, that many more colder Arctic or, or colder polar air blasts into our region. Well, not really. The effects of it were, of El Nino this year were actually pretty minimal. And it was actually predicted. I didn't read this until uh, recently when I, when I was starting to prepare the, for the presentation I'm going to say a month ago, but it was more like yesterday. Just kidding. But <laughs> I've had this presentation for a long time, but I really didn't look into the effects uh, on this winter as much until just a few days ago. But I, uh, they had predicted this months back. They predicted that, yeah, we're going to be, we're going to, th there's a 60% chance in Wisconsin that your temperatures are going to be on average higher than, than average. And precipitation, you're going to have about a 40% chance that you're going to have less precip precipitation than normal, which doesn't jive with your typical El Nino results here in the Midwest. Typically, we have a little bit more snowfall than average. The problem is, is uh, El Nino is not the only thing that influences our, our winter weather. There are other climatic oscillations out there, a few of them. There's actually more than just these three, but these are the big players. The, w the way that all the stars lined up, if you're into astrology, you're going to love that uh, analogy, but the way that the stars all lined up this particular year, the, the, uh, the conditions of, the, of these different oscillations, the phases, all came to be that, that the, the likely pattern was going to keep, um, basically keep the different atmospheric circulations from from um, being as such that would give us more precipitation than normal. The temperature prediction was there, but the, the, the typical pattern of El Nino winters having more precipitation in the upper part of the country didn't happen. And again, it was mostly because of the, um, uh, the state, the, 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 the current state of, of these three different oscillations. But there are other things that go along with it as well. Uh, soil moisture, the amount of water in, in the soils, for instance. Um, was it a summer or two? We had a pretty dry um, summer, and, and, and that can have actually long-lasting effects for many years after both winter and summer weather patterns. But other uh, and other longer-term trends, like like lake temperature, for instance, of all the Great Lakes. We know a couple a few years ago we had that extremely cold winter that was not a result of any La Nina or El Nino or anything like that. It, just was more of a result of these other types of uh, variables that go into forecasting. But those, those of the effects of the colder lake temperatures from just a couple of or three years ago are still having longer term uh, kind of wave-like effects throughout our region, especially during the winter months. So all these things put together basically outweighed the effects of El Nino this particular winter for our part of the country. 
Normally, El Nino is one of the stronger variables that determines your, your seasonal outlook, but this year it was not. So if anybody asks and they say, well, these El Nino guys, you know what they're talking about, you got to say, well, look, there's other things that go into our winter weather predictions. And this year, by chance, these other things that came together, their signals were strong enough to kind of outweigh the effects of El Nino. So that's what we have. We, did, we did, certainly got our typical temperature, warmer temperatures than normal. But why is that? Why do we get warmer temperatures up here during El Nino? Think about the amount of humidity I talked about that's pumped into the atmosphere. And as I said earlier, water vapor not only is just water droplets floating around the air, it actually holds energy. Water has an extremely, it, ha it has a great capability of holding energy and heat. So the more water vapor, the more humidity is in the air, the warmer generally it's going to be. And this is especially important during our winters when we're normally a very dry atmosphere. That's why it's so cold. When you're a lot, humid, when you're a lot more humid than normal, the temperatures aren't going to be as, as you know, biting cold. We're still cold. I mean, we're in Wisconsin. We have cold winters, but not nearly as bad as we normally have because of the amount of increased water vapor, humidity in the atmosphere. <clears throat> okay, I will play this guy for you, and I'll show you where we're at right now with, with El Nino. <clears throat> oh, he lost my settings. No, we didn't. Okay, good. All right. This is what's currently going on right now. The colors underneath are showing the anomalies or the departures from the average of sea surface temperatures. This yellowish glow along the equator here in the central and eastern part, you can see that in the eastern part of the, Paci uh, the equatorial Pacific now, they're pretty much warmer than average still, yes, and less warmer than average, but still warmer than average in the central part. And as you can see, the, these lines that are moving are actually the directions of the ocean current. Don't be fooled. They're not moving that fast. It's just an animation to show you the kind of general flow and pattern of the ocean currents uh, in this area. And this is normal. But thing is, during El Nino, we usually see not as much of a nice, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not, you don't see a, such a nice and neat flow of east to west. Usually you see the, the lines kind of going, spreading a little bit north and south and not being nearly, a, and, and these lines not being nearly as long, meaning that the, the flow is not very organized. The water sits more stagnant than has a nice current pattern during El Ninos. So what this is indicating is that we're actually starting to get out of the current El Nino that we're in right now. And as predicted, what they predicted is by, the, by right around the end of this winter, this El Nino is going to die down and go back to more normal conditions and possibly lead into uh, a La Nina in the months to come, whether it be a few months or a year or so, we can pretty much expect some La Nina conditions to start. And by looking at the organization of these ocean currents being so well uniform east and west, uniform was the word I was looking for, <laughs> uh, you can see the more uniform flow going east to west, this starts to indicate that we're going back to normal conditions. And as you can see, the sea surface temperature anomalies in this region aren't, and you see some reds up in, you know, north and south of the equator, but in the, right around the equator itself is where you see the sea surface temperature patterns developing, whether it be in El Nino or back to normal conditions or into La Nina conditions. This is where you see it happening. So this lighter yellow, and I don't have the, uh, the legend up, but this lighter yellow indicates a little bit warmer than average, but not much. And you're approaching pretty much average temperatures now for this time of year. So what we're looking at is we're pretty much, uh, we're leaving our El Nino and going back to normal conditions now. I could show a few more variables on here actually real quick before we get out of here. <clears throat> Maybe show surface wind patterns here. Let's go air. Let's go s surface winds. There we go. Okay, good. Now this is showing our surface winds in this region. And this is perfect because our, it shows the Subtropical high right here, right? Okay, so it's showing it's kind of weak right now, but you can see this southern flank of it is put, the southern flank of the subtropical high surface winds flow east to west, sort of pushing you know the east to west flow of this region, right? Whereas the western, or the pardon me, the northern flank of it is what drives the the east to west, pardon me, the west to east flow over the North American continent, over the continental United States. But the organization of these, of this, uh, of this uh, 
the directional flow of the surface winds now is also indicative of coming back to normal conditions, where normally if it was still pretty strong El Nino conditions, you wouldn't see uh, such a nice kind of uh, uh, pattern coming out of the northeast going southwest like this. The, the, again, the patterns would be more or less all over the place and not very uniform as far as their, their geographic patterns. <clears throat> Okay, I went a lot longer than I thought. That's what we do. I'm sorry. The instructors are terrible like that. <laughs> All right. Concluding remarks real quick. Okay, as I said earlier, it's, El Nino is not a storm. It's a climate system almost entirely of itself. It's a coupled climate system. It relies heavily on what's going on in the ocean, namely the sea surface temperatures, controlled largely by the depth of the thermocline below. We have known about El Nino for a long time, since the 1500s. Peruvian fishermen told us all about it. So this isn't something that you know, a lot of times you hear, like, well, because of global warming, we have this thing called El Nino. No, no, that's not true. This has always been around. We're just starting to really understand it, especially the second half of the, of the 1900s, of the second half of the 20th century, where we really started getting a lot more data collected. Again, with, with anything with atmospheric sciences and weather prediction, the more data you have, the more accurate your predictions are going to be. People complain about the weathermen all the time. They get paid so much for not knowing what they talk about. Well, I'll tell you what, for not having a whole lot of data to work with in their, in their models, I think they do a pretty darn good job of at least getting us right around about what temperature we're going to be at and generally getting right whether or not it's going to rain. Maybe not the snowfall amounts as much, but they certainly, if they say it's going to snow, generally it does. If it's going to rain, generally it does. So I think they do a pretty good job considering they only have a half a century's worth of, da of good data or so. Before that, not much. And you think of, you know, now we take all sorts of atmospheric readings from humidity to wind direction and, and wind speed and, and everything else that we have every second. Whereas before, we would just have, oh, a few times a day we'd take these things. So think about that. <clears throat> Okay, and again, El Nino and La Nina are not complete opposites. El Nino is more of a relaxation of a normal condition, whereas La Nina is more of an amplification of the normal conditions. And again, they're not a flip-flop. You're talking about a seesaw that never really flips over to the other side. You're talking like a half seesaw here. That's about it. <clears throat> So uh, as, far, and as far as the conclusions with how this affects the, the United States weather, the warmer the sea surface temperatures are, the more it's going to strengthen our subtropical high. The more that subtropical high is strengthened, the farther south it's going to pull our jet stream. And our jet stream, again, is that boundary, basically, between the warm air to the south, the cold air to the north, and this is where all the storm action is. So wherever that jet stream uh, average position uh, is, you're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of preci uh, higher precipitation amounts around that region. You're also going to have cooler temperatures if, it, if it's pulled farther south, especially into the southern U.S. where it's normally pretty warm. <clears throat> and just the opposite during La Nina. La Nina expands that subtropical high, so it keeps the jet stream farther north. And that allows all that warm tropical air to push well up into the southern part of the U.S. and up into our midsection, as you rem remember from that one map. So you can expect much warmer and drier conditions in the south during La Nina, and much, not much cooler, but certainly cooler and much wetter conditions in the south during El Nino when the jet streams pulled farther south. And again, this, this year's Godzilla, <laughs> it's mostly uh, the effects of El Nino were not nearly as pronounced as normal due to the other various uh, type of climatic uh, oscillation systems that we have that, that really do have quite an effect on our winters. For whatever this, for what, for the reasons of those all coming together in the in the in the proper proportions, kind of diluted the effects of El Nino for us this winter, especially us here in the northern part of the country. Questions, comments, concerns, or complaints? <laughs>